Let me go ahead and say happy Sabbath to everyone. Question for you. Are you really happy? Amen. Amen. I want to thank my young friends for preparing my mind to share the word of God with you all. I am uh, very thankful to be here at the Norwalk Church. I appreciate the graciousness of your pastor, as well as the other members that I've had the privilege of meeting thus far, and of course, Brother Lito being God's instrument in putting this together, and I'm very, very thankful for the opportunity to share God's word with my fellow workers, uh, Brother Johnson, Brother Chung, brothers that I respect, and am truly thankful for the way the Lord has used them. And I thank God especially for the way God used Brother Johnson this morning. How many of you were blessed by that presentation? Very powerful. Very powerful. Very, very timely. And so I simply want to partake of that spirit and ask God to do something special through me during our time together. We are going to truly study the Word. We're going to take a look at what the Word of God says and by His grace get a clear understanding of what He wants us to do at such a time as this in earth's history the best way to prepare our minds to receive the word i am fully convinced is upon our knees and so if we can kneel to go before the lord and if you can't kneel just bow your head reverently but if you can kneel let's kneel together and let's ask the lord to do something special as he speaks to our heart this morning Our loving Father, we are truly grateful for the opportunity to come together as a family, to study your wonderful words of life, to partake even from the tree of life. For this is what your word is to us. It provides not that which is only temporal, but also that which is eternal. And so, Lord, we come before you asking for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, there's so many people in this room, and every single individual has a specific need. I pray that through our time together in study that you will fulfill your words and supply all of our needs according to your riches and glory by none other than Christ Jesus. And Lord, while you'll bless my brothers and sisters, I'm sure, I pray please don't pass me by. Grant me a fresh revelation of your love. And I pray that all of us will leave here different than when we came in. For this is our prayer that we do ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the focus and the emphasis of our time together this weekend is understanding we are living in the time of the anti-typical day of atonement, a time of judgment. A time where God is zooming in on all who are professing to follow him, to know him, and to love him, and are devoted to him. And this is a time where God is looking into your life and into my life, and he's going to help us see where we are consistent and where we are inconsistent. And where we are consistent, he will strengthen us. Where we are inconsistent, he's going to help us see it, that we might come to him, that we might overcome the inconsistency. The great purpose of God in doing this is that he knows that we're getting towards the end. I am not sure if you are aware of it. We are very much living, not merely in the end of time, but we're living in the end of the end of time. We are very paper thin close, if you will, to finally seeing Christ burst through the clouds of glory and taking his bride home. But the Bible is very clear that something must be done that we might be able to go home with him. And I want you to see what the Bible says in the book of Mark. Go to the book of Mark, the 13th chapter, and I want you to watch what the Bible says here. We're looking at Mark, the 13th chapter, and I want you to watch what the text says. Mark, the 13th chapter, and I want you to watch this. We're going to consider very quickly the great purpose of prophecy. We're talking right now about this investigative judgment that we're in. That was a prophecy, Daniel 8 and verse 14, a text that is very near and dear to the heart of those who are part of the remnant in God's last moments in earth's history. And so it is, what really does God want us to do when we think about prophecy? In Mark, the 
18th chapter, and when you're there, amen? amen? The Bible says in Mark 13, we're going to consider verse 23. Jesus was going through many prophetic events. He was talking about things that were to come. And as Jesus began to unfold those things, he makes a very simple point in Mark 13 in verse 23. The Bible says, but take ye what? But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus makes it clear. Take heed. I want you to do something about it. The faithful student in God's mind is not the one who is merely aware of all the prophetic events. That's not the faithful student. It might look faithful to a lot of people, but it's not in truth the faithful student. I'll give it to you in another text to make you think about it a little bit deeper. Go to Proverbs 22. When you look at Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, I'm sure you can appreciate this verse. And we're going to just simply talk very practically. In Proverbs, the 22nd chapter, I want you to watch what the Bible says as we consider verse 3. The Bible says something very powerful, very beautiful, and also very practical. It says in Proverbs 22 and verse 3, if you're there, please say amen. amen. The Bible says, the what kind of man? The prudent. What's another word for prudent? Wise. wise. Very good. So the wise man. It says the wise man sees the evil that comes. And what does he do? He hideth himself. It says, but the simple, they pass on and they are punished. Now, I am not wise just because I see the evil coming. Because when you study Bible prophecy, will you not see a lot of evil that's coming? Will you not see a lot of evil that's here? You're going to see a whole lot of evil. The Bible, unfortunately, has a lot to say about the evils that's going to happen both last night, I told you, in the world and in the church. Tons of evil. But we're not wise just because we clearly say, I see the evil. The Bible says the prudent or the wise man, he sees the evil that's coming, and what does he do? He hides himself. He takes the appropriate action that he is protected from the evil that's coming. That's a wise person, isn't it? You see, Jesus, when he said, when you see all these things coming to pass, he says the goal is that you take heed, not just simply gloat over the fact you know. There's no blessing in knowing what's coming if you don't know what to do when it arrives. You understand that? And so what God wants for you and what he wants for me, what he wants so desperately for all of his people is not merely to know what's coming. Now, keep in mind, he wants us to know. You heard that statement that pastor said earlier. We read it right there in Romans 13. It says, and that knowing the time. Now it's high time. But it gave us an action. It says that we are to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. And we're told to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the point is very simple, family. The great grand purpose of prophecy, it doesn't matter if it's Daniel 8, 14 and the 2300 days. It doesn't matter if it's Revelation 13 and it's talking about the mark of the beast. It does not matter what the prophecy is. The first step of God is that we know it. And then the second step, which is the most important step, is that you put yourself in harmonious action with what God told you to do, knowing that that thing is coming. That is your safety, nothing else. Your safety is what you're doing with what you know, not with what you know. You understand that dividing line? Is that clear? Yeah. This is simple, right? Yeah. Simple. And so what does Jesus want us to do? The great purpose of prophecy. Go to John 14. Let's talk about it. In John 14, right? I want you to watch what the Bible says. I like the language. John 14. Jesus, the master teacher, he himself makes us aware of the great purpose of prophecy. And the Bible says in the book of John, we're looking at the 14th chapter, and I want you to watch what the text says as we consider verse 29. The Bible says in John 14, right there in verse 29, the Bible says, and now I have told you before it come to pass, so that when it comes to pass, you might do what? You might believe. I told you before it comes to pass, so that when it comes to pass, you might believe. There's something very special about believing. 
The first point I want to show you that's special about believing is go right up to verse 12. Same book, same chapter, John 14. But go up to verse 12. What is one of the beautiful points about believing? The Bible says in John 14, we're considering now verse what? Verse 12. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, what else? Shall he do also. And not only that, it says not only though he shall do it also, but greater works shall he do. Now, please, let's get the context. Nobody can do greater works than Jesus. Nobody can do a greater miracle. Nobody can preach the word greater. No one can do that. But there is one thing we can do even more than Jesus. We can have a wider influence than he had personally on this earth. That's the context of the greater works. The greater works is that we will get a wider sphere. You see, when Jesus came to the earth, did he come to preach the gospel? Did he do that? How much coverage did he make as far as the earth was concerned? He basically focused in the Middle East. Is that not right? But think about this. When he endowed the Spirit of God to his disciples, by the time you get to the book of Colossians chapter 1, literally from verse 23 to 26, the Bible says the whole gospel went all over the world. Do you see that? So Jesus, he says, look, I only got to a certain sphere, but I know whoever receives my word and my spirit, they will have a greater sphere of coverage than even I myself had. That's what he was talking about. And so it is that Jesus, he says, listen, one of the great blessings of believing is that when you believe on me, the works that I do, you're going to do it also. But watch this. Go one chapter before, John 13. Look at this. And I love this one. And I believe this is very relevant. This is something, I can't wait to talk about this. We're going to talk about very real, practical preparation for that outpouring of God's Spirit that this work might get finished. We're going to talk about that. The Bible says in John the 13th chapter, something else happens when he tells us things before they come to pass so that when they come to pass, we might believe. Notice what the Bible says in John 13. It says in John 13, right there, in verse 19, same principle that we just read in John 14, 29, but I like the close of this verse just a bit better. It says in John 13 and verse 19, Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, you may believe that what? I am he. My brothers and sisters, those words speak volumes. When we understand the prophetic events that are happening around us, Jesus says that is when it is imperative that my people understand that when you see these things come to pass, you'll remember I am everything I said I was. You know, right now, there are people who see time is almost finished. They see prophecy being fulfilled. And some of them are literally being overwhelmed with fear. Have you met anybody like that? Did not Jesus make promises to us that he will protect us? So why are you overwhelmed with fear? You know why? Because you don't believe that he is who he said he was. There are people right now that when they see prophecy unfolding, I heard my dear brother here talk about how the economy is getting a little bit better, and I agree. It is happening, but we also understand that when they start crying peace and safety, we know what's coming afterwards. Right? Sudden destruction. Now, the key is, is that even when the economy was going bad, according to prophecy, many people started getting worried about their money. And the fact that we were getting worried is indicative that we don't believe that he is who he said he was. He said he'll supply all of our needs. God says, I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I got you. When we get sick, and I'm not talking about the flu, I'm not talking about a cold, I'm talking about a diagnosis that as a result of this diagnosis, you now got something where you are coming face to face potentially with death, cancer, various neurological diseases, heart disease. When you discover that you got something that could potentially kill you. Do you know one of the number one things most of us say is, where is God? Even though he said, lo, I'm with you always. One of the great things that God really wants to get across to you and I, that we might do his work very effectively, is that when we see 
prophecy being fulfilled, the number one thing on God's mind is, I want you to be convinced I am who I said I am. Do you remember what the Bible says in that twofold instruction in Hebrews 11 and verse 6? I would imagine many of us know that verse. It says, but without faith, it is what? Impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe, what are the next two words? That he is. Then it says, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But the first thing God says is, do you believe that I am who I said I am? Until we are convinced that God is who he said he is, all of our religious activity does not please him. Can you imagine that? All of our religious activity, he's not pleased yet. Oh, he's patient. Thank the Lord he's patient. But he's not pleased. I don't want God just to be patient with me. I want God to be pleased with me. And God says, you know what I'm pleased? When you really are convinced that I am everything that I said I am to you, Dwayne. You know, if you go through the Bible, there's many things Jesus said he was. He said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want to know how to get the salvation? I am the way. You want to know what truth is? I am the truth. You want to have eternal life? I am the life. He's making it clear. This is who I am. Not only that, John 11 and verse 25, he also said, I am the resurrection. Why are you so afraid of death when all it is is asleep? Family, listen, I'm, I'm talking like brass tacks bottom line with you all. Some things that we do as children of God does not make a lot of sense if we really are convinced that God is everything he said he is. I heard of a man in Northern California, I know him personally, he was having stomach problems, you know, eating food. And he, you know, started noticing, man, I'm not, I'm not hungry anymore. I don't really have much of an appetite. Started losing weight spontaneously. Nobody knew why. He wasn't working out or anything. Started losing weight, losing his appetite, getting these fevers and whatnot. What does that sound like? Sounds like cancer. Went to the doctor, got checked out. They discovered he had stomach cancer. They said, sir, you have stomach cancer and it doesn't look good. Everybody said that he was just withering away. And they said that this brother looked like he was at the brink of death. And when they came to him and they said, how is your courage? I've lived a full life. I've served God. I've watched my children grow. He said, and I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. He said, I trust him. Whatever he wants, let his will be done. The saints of God were marveling at his courage. Do you know today that man is completely cancer-free and restored? <laughs> that brother said, Lord, I'm, I'm in your hands. He took seriously that statement, that question that Paul asked. Remember that question Paul asked? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own? You've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Paul made a statement that this brother took absolutely literally. He said, I belong to him. Whatever he wants to do, even with this clay, I'm all right with it. Because you know what? I've lived a long life and I am a little tired and I don't mind taking a nap. I said, oh, Father, give me such faith. Give me such courage that I can be convinced you're everything that you said you are. Everything. And Jesus says one of the ways that I'm going to help convince you is with prophecy. Behold, I tell you these things before they come to pass. So when they come to pass, you might believe I am he. Everything I said is trustworthy. Jesus not only said these things, he said in John 8, 58, that I am. He literally called himself Jehovah. I love sharing that with my Jehovah Witnesses friends. He called himself Jehovah. Before Abraham was, he said, I am the self-existent one. Jesus called himself that. 
The Bible also says in Matthew 5 and verse 17, he's the one who came to live in harmony with the law of God and not to destroy it. I am not come that I might destroy the law. I am come that I might fulfill it, live in harmony with it. These are all the things Jesus said, I am. He also said in Matthew 9 and verse 13, Romans 5 and verse 10, he said, I am come that I might call sinners to repentance and that they might have eternal life. He, according to Romans, not Matthew 9, 13, Romans 5, 10, he came to save wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked enemies from the path of sin and calling them to his righteousness. So why are you going around saying I'm too wicked to come to God? You see, when a man or when a woman says, I'm too evil, I'm too wicked, I'm too nasty, there's no way that God can forgive me. You know why people say that? Because they don't understand who he is. Christ did not come to save saints. He came to save the nastiest creations in all of the universe. There should be nobody in this room that has committed such vulgar, gross, terrible sins that you actually are being convinced by the devil that you are so wretched you can't even come to God. Jesus says they don't understand who I am. Jesus said mankind was so messed up I actually came clothed with their messed upness. I made that word up. He said, I'm going to clothe myself with sinful flesh. That's Romans 8 and verse 3. You can compare Psalms 51, 5 and Romans 1 and verse 3. That's beautiful. David said in Psalms 51, 5, I'm born in sin and shaping in iniquity. David acknowledged, I am born with a sinful nature. When you go to Romans 1 and verse 3, the Bible says Jesus had the same nature David had. Jesus had a sinful nature, but he never sinned. You and I can have a sinful nature. But praise God in that Sabbath school study, we can have victory over all sin. Amen. This is who he is. He said, I did this just for you. Not only that, John 10 and verse 36, he says, I am the son of God. Matthew 28, 20, he said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. You see, I don't know what you see when you study prophecy, but I know what God called me to see. God does not just want me to see the evil that's coming. He wants me to see where I can hide myself. And if I'm hid in Christ, this great I am, then I have what the prophet of God says in Life Sketches 196. I have nothing to fear for the future. Amen. Except as I shall forget the way the Lord has led in our teachings and in his past history. I have nothing to fear and you have nothing to fear. The key is get to know who he is. There is something very special that Jesus wants us to know about him that actually is preparatory for receiving the latter rain, that great outpouring of his spirit that the work might get finished. And I want to show you it starting in Matthew, the 11th chapter. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, the 11th chapter, Matthew, the 11th chapter. And I want you to watch this. I love these words. These words are so filled with so much beautiful counsel, so much excellent instruction, so much deep detail. And I want you to watch it. The Bible says in the book of Matthew, we're looking at the what chapter? And we're going to verse 28. The Bible says in Matthew 11, we're looking at verse 28. He says what? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and he says and I will give you rest then he says take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly of heart and you will find rest unto your soul and I love the clothes for my yoke is and my burden is this statements from Jesus if you in this room right now got some yokes and burdens in your life that are so heavy that they feel like they're crushing you, there is one guarantee I can give you. God did not give you that burden. Did you hear that? You probably missed it. If you got a yoke or a burden on your life right now, and it is so heavy that it is almost impossible for you to find happiness, to find joy, and to have God's peace. The one thing I can guarantee you is God did not put that burden on you. The Bible says his yokes are easy and his burdens are light. Some of us are taking on too much. And it's crushing you. And God has never asked you 
to take on what he can handle. God is a big man. He can handle a lot. I would like to recommend that you learn to go unto him. What a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. God says, listen, I didn't ask you to bear all these burdens. Oh, Lord, I got way with children. And some of us don't even know how to be happy anymore. Oh, Lord, I got sickness, so I have this. And it seems like we have no peace whatsoever. God says you're allowing too much of the burden to rest on you. God says you need to come to me and understand that I am not merely the sin bearer. I'm also the burden bearer. Learn to let him transfer that weight on his back because he can handle it. I always think on the cross, I got enough problems just in my 46 years of living. Believe that. And I got to deal with my issues. Just me. Jesus, you ever thought about this? Jesus bore the burdens of humanity and the sins of humanity, past, present, and future, all on his own back. How in the world did he do that? I'm so thankful he doesn't ask us to do that. He says, that's a prerogative that belongs to me because I could handle it. And so he says, the yokes that I give you, they should be easy. Doesn't mean they're non-existent, but they should be easy. You should be able to continue maintaining love, joy, peace, and long-suffering, and all these things. It should be easy. You should be able to, yes, bear burdens, especially to the burden bearers in the room, the preachers and the teachers of righteousness. We should be able to bear the burdens that God has called us to in the gospel work, but it should not crush us. I've never heard of a peacefully stressed out brother. That doesn't even make sense. You understand that? But you go to the average minister of the gospel, man, I'm stressed. It's like, why are you stressed? Maybe you're taking on too much. You know what I tell the ministers? I tell the ministers, I said, you need to read letter 3B, 1881. I give them that, letter 3B. For the ministers in the room, please write down, letter 3B as in boy, 1881. You need to read that letter that the, uh, the servant of the Lord wrote. She wrote in a wonderful letter. She said, many of us go forward in God's work, treating the work as if we must do it or the work won't get done. Does that sound like some burden bearers in this room? I'm, 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 a, I'm a, what do they say, like you're rehabilitated? I'm a rehabilitated burden, burden bearer. I'm not letting that happen anymore. I'm serious. Sometimes we convince ourselves, if I don't do it, it won't get done. She says, if you approach God's work, going into it as if you must do it or it won't get done, she says, it will crush you. She says, it will crush you. And she says, and you will discover after all that God did not call you to bear such burdens. Mercy. Letter 3B, 1881. That is to the burden bearers in the room. But I want you to watch this. It was verse 29 where I saw an instruction from Jesus that I said, we need to look at this. Look at what it says here. Take my yoke upon you and do what? Now notice what Jesus highlights he wants us to learn. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for because I am meek and lowly in heart. And this is how you'll find rest unto your soul. According to the verse, what does Jesus want us to learn of him? His meekness and his lowliness of heart. The whole reason the gospel went live, the whole reason the gospel went from a concept to a reality in the life of Jesus was because of his humility. It was the humility of Christ that governed his every move in gospel work. And I'm going to show it to you. And this humility of Christ is something he so wants his people to be aware of that he actually said it, even though many of us missed it. Do you know how many people read Matthew 11:28 28 to 30 and miss the point? This was the lesson he wanted to teach us. This is how you get the rest. I've learned something a long time ago. I'm the father of four children, ages 20, 19, 18, and 16, and in November will be 17. Three adults in my house. 
I can still remember when they were all little babies in my arms. And one of the things that I noticed that's very important in fatherhood, and I'm sure my wife will tell you in motherhood, it is not enough to tell children what to do. It is imperative that you show them how to do what to do. You got to show them this is how you do what I just told you to do. I can't go to my son and say, clean up your room. I got to show him this is what a clean room looks like. And I have to do it in such a way that I let them see through my own example when they come to my room that they will say, oh, that's what a clean room looks like. Okay, now I know what to do. You understand that? Now watch this. Jesus literally says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But he said, but this is how I give you the rest. The way that I give you the rest is he says, I need you to learn of me. What is it that I want you to learn? I want you to learn my meekness and my lowliness, my humility. How many of you have ever had an argument or a sharp disagreement with somebody? You ever had that? Now, if you're not lifting up your hands... I dare to say, not only are you lying, you're lying in the church and you're lying on God's holy Sabbath day. <laughs> now watch this. Do you know the foundation to all arguments? Go to Proverbs 13. Look at this. Proverbs, the 13th chapter. Watch what the Bible says. Proverbs, we're looking at the 13th chapter. In Proverbs 13, foundation... I don't care if it's between a husband and a wife, a brother and a sister, a pastor and a member. It doesn't matter. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, we're looking at the 13th chapter, and I believe the words of Jesus. I hope you do too. Now notice what the Bible says. This is, this is the foundation. The curse causeless shall not come. Anytime you have a problem, don't deal with the symptom. Ascertain the cause. What caused this issue? Because the cure is in the cause. Once you find out what causes a problem, you just found your cure. Proverbs 13. What does it say in verse 10? What's the first word? Only. Now watch this. It says, only by pride cometh contention. Only by what? Only by pride cometh contention. But with the well-advised is wisdom. What is the foundational reason for the various contentions that we have? Pride. What is the opposite of pride? Humility. Do you know the more of the humility of Christ that you and I have is the less disagreements we will have with others? The less arguments we'll have with others. This study of pride and humility, I'm telling you, I've done a very exhaustive study on this. I looked up all these verses that talk about pride. I looked up all these verses that talk about humility. And my brothers and sisters, I had no idea how much heaven is interested in this subject. But watch this, it gets deeper than that. Go to Acts chapter 3. I smiled when I came in here. And I saw my dear brother Michael going into Acts 3 and verse 19. Is there somewhere where humility plays a role in preparation for the outpouring of God's spirit through the latter rain? Notice what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 3, I want you to watch what the text says as we consider Acts. We're looking at the third chapter and we're going to again look at verse 19. The Bible says in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. The Bible says, Repent ye therefore and be what? Converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of what? Refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. The times of refreshing is the outpouring of God's Spirit. That's the refreshing. And that times of refreshing, the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit, early rain, but also, in this case, latter rain. The Bible says there's some preliminary steps. One of the first steps, after you repent, what's the next step? You must be what? You must be converted. Now go to Matthew 18. If you look at Matthew, the 18th chapter, I want you to watch what the Bible says here now. Matthew, we're going to the 18th chapter. And I want you to watch what the Bible says. The Bible makes it clear, if you're going to receive the latter rain, then you must not only repent, but you must also be converted. Now, the Bible says this 
in Matthew, the 18th chapter, and we're going to consider verses 1 to 4. The Bible says in Matthew 18, starting at verse 1, it says, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called who? A little child. Unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be what? Except ye be converted and become as little children. So what is the indicator of what it means to be converted? To be like what? To be like a little child. Now let's go ahead and fold, unfold this some more. He says, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Lord, what do you mean? Verse 4. He says, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Show me a truly converted man, and I will show you a humble man. Show me a truly converted woman, and I will show you a humble woman. My brothers and sisters, nobody's going to get into the kingdom if they have not received the humility of Christ. No one will receive the latter rain except they receive the humility of Christ. And so this becomes an absolute imperative. You remember what the Bible says? Blessed are the meek, which is synonymous to the humble, for they shall inherit the earth. God says, I need my people to focus on this thing. Study the humility of Jesus. Now, I thought to myself, I said, all right, Lord, well, that's pretty powerful. You see, the Bible says, repent ye therefore, be converted. You read this. And Matthew 18, verses 1 to 4. Charles Spurgeon made a very powerful statement about humility. He says, do not desire to be the principal man in the church. He says, be lowly, be humble. The best man in the church is the man who is willing to be a doormat for all to wipe their boots on. The brother who does not mind what happens to him at all so long as God is glorified. I appreciate that. God wants us to understand the more and still more that we receive the humility of Christ, the more that we make this our focus, the more that we make this our study. Can I show you a practical example of the humility of Jesus? My wife and I was going over this in, in our worship this morning. So powerful. Go to John chapter 10. You know, in fact, let's do this first. Let's go to Philippians 2 first, then we'll go to John chapter 10. Let's bring out some practical points of the humility of Jesus. Okay? Notice this. When we look at Philippians chapter 2, that's where we're going first. Then after that, we're going to go to John 10. Philippians chapter 2. I want you to watch what the Bible says. In Philippians, the second chapter, God says, starting at verse 6, no, verse 5. In Philippians 2, starting at verse 5, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay? Now he begins to unfold the mind of Christ. Verse 6. He says, Who thought it, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is a major step down for Jesus. The very fact that he was side by side with the Father, had complete equality to the Father, and decided I'm going to actually no longer function like an equal, I'm now going to function like a servant. I'm now going to put myself in a situation that I'm going to face temptations. I'm going to put myself at a risk that if I sin even once, I have to allow the Father to kill me. This is the level of risk that Jesus was willing to take just to save you just to save me, a bunch of enemies. But that's not enough. When he walked on this earth, I want you to think about this. When he came to this earth, he came to bless us. Is that right? He came to bless us. And keep in mind, Jesus is the creator. Colossians chapter 1, 15 through 18 makes that like super crystal clear. He, by him, were all things made. Okay? Christ made all these things, including you and me. You and me. Go to John 10. 
Sometimes you got you to take your time when you go through these verses. Go to John 10. I want you to look at this. Imagine the creator. The creator of humanity. The creator of the universe. Right now, what I want to do is I want to contrast the mind of Christ to your mind and my mind. The Bible says in John the 10th chapter, if you're there, just say amen. Look at this. In John 10, Jesus wanted to establish a point. I'm picking up in the middle of the story, and we'll just go down to verse 17. In John 10 and verse 17, the Bible says, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So Jesus is teaching some deep theology. He's teaching some deep gospel truth. I am laying down my life for you guys. Y'all rejected me, but I'm still willing to lay down my life for you. And I'm going to take it back up again so that I can intercess forever on your behalf until probation closes. This is what I'm willing to do for you. Look at how they respond in the next verse. Verse 19, it says, There was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these sayings. Verse 20, And many of them said, He has a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Now, what you need to understand is when they said that, they were not whispering. They were not going to people saying, He has a devil. He's mad. Don't listen to him. That's not what they were doing. They were in his face. He has a devil. This man is mad. Don't listen to anything he says. They are saying this in a way that even Jesus can hear this. Now, he's God. He made an awesome sacrifice to save these people. He came only to bless these people. And now he's trying to bless these people. And in return, they're calling God a devil. They're calling a very sane man that he's out of his mind. And they're telling everybody he wants to listen to him, don't listen to him. In our natural human nature, there would be something that would rise up to say, hold up, did you just call me a devil? Why would you call me a devil? I don't understand that. Why would you, why would you call me a devil? No, well, let's just, no, I don't want to move on. Let, let's talk about that for a second. In natural human nature, something called retaliation would kick in. You just called me a devil. You just said I'm crazy. And you just told everybody, don't listen to me. I want you to imagine you're in a church, Brother Michael, Brother Peter. You're in a church. You're preaching. And somebody stands up in the congregation and says, this man has a devil. He does not know what he's talking about. And if I were you, I'd leave this sanctuary right now and leave. There would be some elements that would come up from your belly. And there would at least be a temptation, if not a fulfillment of that temptation, to retaliate to what that person just did. I wonder what Jesus did. They just said all this stuff about him. Let's look at how he responded. So they said these things. Now, verse 21, it says, Others said, These are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the de dedication, and it was winter. Then verse 23, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, how long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, at this point, they already called him a devil. They already called him mad. And they already told everybody, don't listen. But now they're coming to him saying, look, if you're the Christ, then just tell us and make it plain. Jesus has every right to say, I have nothing to say to you. Because they were just disrespectful. Jesus could have retaliated. Before I tell you anything, we need to address this thing about you calling me a devil. This is very human nature. Am I right or wrong? This is how normally we would react. What does Jesus do? It says in the next verse, in verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe me not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you believe me not because you're not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Literally, Jesus just goes back to teaching the gospel. He's not retaliating. He's not responding back. He's not holding them accountable. Hold up, you just called me this. We need to square that away before we have any further dialogue. 
Jesus is not even interested in vindicating his hurt because he was not hurt. He did not take it personal. He was able to hear what they said, and he knew why they said it. Go to Luke 23. I'll tell you why they said it. Keep your finger on John 10, but go to Luke 23. In Luke 23, remember, keep your finger on John 10. This is the context of why Jesus could take so much abuse from his own people, the people he came to save, the people he came to serve. Luke 23. The Bible says right there in Luke 23, right there in verse 34, this was not an understanding that Christ had while he was on the cross. This was an understanding that Christ had throughout his entire ministry. The Bible says in Luke 23, right there in verse 34, it says, then said Jesus, Father, do what? Why did he say that? Because they know not what they're doing. This is why Je Jesus had no time to allow self, ego, and all these other terribly negative, wicked things in our character. He had no time for that. Yes, you called me a devil. Yes, you said I'm out of my mind. Yes, you said I don't know what I'm talking about and you don't want anybody to listen to me, but you don't know what you're saying right now. You don't really understand what you're saying. And so what Jesus did not do is he did not use their insults and their threats as an opportunity to allow self to rise up. Why? Because he said, learn of me that I'm meek. I'm lowly in heart. And his lowness gets even lower. Look at what it says in John 10 again. You're back in John 10? Remember I told you you said don't lose your finger there? After Jesus ministers unto them, he then says in verse 30, I and my Father are one. What did they do in verse 31? Then the Jews took up stones again to... See, sometimes y'all run too, fa too fast to these verses. Jesus just said, I and my Father, we are one. He's making this point because his desire is to win them. I and my father are one. Everything you guys have been studying, I showed you this. I and my father are one. Then they pick up stones and they want to kill him. Jesus, who could have said, angels, destroy them. Jesus, who could have said, angels, get me out of here. Jesus, who could have done a lot of other things. What does he do in the next verse? It says, Jesus answered them, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of those works do you sow me? He's still reasoning with them. you got to put yourself in the shoes of the story, brothers and sisters. Is this how you would respond? I mean, modern day application, you're right here in the streets of California, and you're like, I am the Father, and you, you're making all these points, and you're talking about Jesus, etc. and those brothers take out guns, and they're putting it to your head. Listen, man. We need to take you out right now. You're telling us our drug lifestyle is a sinful lifestyle. You're telling us that selling drugs, prostitution, practicing sin, you're telling us all these things are wrong. How could you do that? Man, we ought to just blow your brains out right now. And here you are just saying, but my brother, you see, if the only reason why you're even doing that is because you're allowing the devil. Look at what the word of God said. And you're just bringing them back to the word. Bringing them back to trying to edify them. This is what Christ was doing. A man who could have blinked his eye and turned all of them into cockroaches if he wanted to. I mean, think about how much power he had. He could have done anything. And what he did was he kept trying to reach their heart. This is humility in action. And if all that's not bad enough, as we just read, they actually killed him. And even on the cross, shortly before his death, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Have mercy on them. You see, one of the things I've learned, even about reading the pen of inspiration, sometimes Sister White will tell us things that we ought to do. And if you stop there, like if you don't read any further, you actually may feel yourself at a place where it's like, how do I do that? I don't understand how to do that. And this is why you got to learn how to read the whole of the writings. The more we have the humility of Christ to be able to see things the way he sees it. You see, when Jesus was standing before those people, he did not have micro vision. He had macro vision. He was thinking bigger than the, the event that was right in front of him. He knew I could kill them, but if I killed them, that cancels out my whole mission because I didn't come to destroy. I came to save. So Jesus understood 
that would contradict the very reason I came if I were to retaliate. Jesus understood, Father, it is based on ignorance and they don't understand who I am. There's a misunderstanding. That's why when he died, the Spirit of God falls on the disciples and for the last half of that last week in prophecy of Daniel 9, the disciples are confirming the covenant and the Bible says by the time you get to Acts chapter 6, many of the priests that said crucify him became followers. Jesus' patience paid off. Jesus' humility bore fruit. And so it is that Christ literally, he's watching all these things happen. And he's like, look, when people do stuff to me, I don't get caught in the moment. That's a counsel for you. The humility of Christ teaches us never focus on the moment of the action. Jesus understood they don't understand me and they don't understand what I'm trying to do for their benefit. The humility of Christ causes you to look deeper than just what a person says, but it seeks to understand why they said it and can identify it's based on a weakness and my retaliation will only aggravate. Do you know if we function like this, that, that we, we probably would have no more arguments, husbands and wives? Remember, only by pride comes contention. The more we embrace the humility of Jesus, you're going to find less arguments with your wife, brothers. You're going to find less arguments with your husbands, wives. When your children start acting up, that is not our opportunity to start going off on them. And, What's wrong with you? Why is it that you don't do this? I grew up in a house like that. I'm telling you, that plan don't work. That plan does not work. All it does is it makes me more undercover. All right, dad caught me this time. Next time, I will plan better. Those were my resolves. Tried to sneak out the house. He caught me at 2 o'clock. Next time, I got to do this. I got to do this. That's all I did. It never created a desire for me to say, you know, he's right. These things that I'm doing is wrong. I need to change. That never crossed my mind. Everything, the way he would beat me and all that stuff, I was like, all right, take my hit. I'm going to do it better next time. Next time, I'm not going to get caught. That's all that happened. Parents, I'm telling you right now, when you blow up on your children with wrath, and they don't even understand where you're coming from. They don't even understand your love. They don't understand anything. I am telling you right now, you're setting your children up to be perhaps examples of rebellion to other children. You got to learn how to win those rebellious children like how God won his rebellious children. It doesn't mean that there doesn't come a time of discipline, but you remember Exodus 34? You remember that in 5 through 7 where Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. I want to see your glory. And then God, and the Bible says... And the Lord descended in the cloud. I'm quoting Exodus 34, 5. It says, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. Now watch the proclamation. And proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Then comes the seventh element. Then he says, and that by no means will clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. What did God just show us? He said, that's my character. Now, that seventh element, did God let them get away with stuff? No, he didn't. He says, he says I will by no means clear the guilty. God promises, guilty people don't get away with anything. God says, I see everything. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God says, I don't let anybody get away with anything. But God says, but before I visit with capital punishment, I'm going to make sure on record was mercy, graciousness, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. So God says, so when I get to the point that I got to loosen off my belt, God says, when I get to that point, there's going to be a massive record. I tried to win you with my mercy. I tried to win you with my graciousness. I tried to win you with my long suffering. I tried to win you by being abundant in goodness and truth. I tried to win you with keeping mercy for thousands. I tried to win you with forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, and you would not listen. Therefore, Babylon, make them captives. 
That was God's spanking on Israel. It was a rough spanking, brothers and sisters. Do not test God. Do not keep joking around and playing with him. Some of us got mercy. Some of us have seen his graciousness. We've seen his long suffering. And we are like, yep, that's the weak God that we serve. He's just going to let me be like this doormat concept and never hold me accountable. And that's how many of us are treating him. And then one day when that judgment comes, we say to ourselves, where did this come from? How did this happen? Jesus wants us to understand humility does not negate judgment. Humility does not negate the fact that if you won't listen, eventually some judgment is going to have to fall. Some punishment is going to have to fall. It's just that God's not quick to destroy. God is not quick to cut off. He labors and labors and labors until he sees there is no other course. This is the only way we can get their attention. And then he lets stuff fall on us, brothers and sisters, and the hope is that he gets our attention. The humility of Christ. Jesus wants us to understand. We're going to have to learn this. We don't understand. We're getting ready to go up again. So, I mean, you know, we're all in this comfortable church, suits and dresses, and, you know, we're talking a lot of religious stuff. But listen, one day somebody's going to come and step to you and slap you in your face. One day somebody's going to literally take your money, freeze your bank account. Some, one day things are going to happen where we're going to be assaulted in ways that were never expected. We're going to see a different world. We're leading to a one world government. We're leading to a new world order. We're getting to a place where eventually the judgment in heaven is going to close. God's people are going to go through a time of trouble. And God says, you need to pay attention to what you're doing right now. Because you're going to need some power that's born of heaven. You're not going to be able to just conceptualize. You know, at pulpits, generally, it's a lot of concepts that are expressed. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that we got to go home and, and digest it. You know what I'm saying? We got to get to a point, Lord, where's my life inconsistent? That's why I appreciate my brother when you were up here saying, you, you're making resolves. You're searching your heart. That's what a sermon is supposed to do. Make you search your heart. Go home and think on these things. Lord, what that preacher just said, that thing stirred my mind. I got to think, where am I inconsistent? What darling sins am I still holding on to? Where is it that I am constantly demonstrating pride and not embracing the humility of the lovely Jesus? That's what a sermon is supposed to do. Make you think. Search your heart. And then to make some serious decisions, no matter what the cost. And this is what God is saying. We are getting ready to go up upon a crisis that there will be no human conjuring that can get past it. Some of us know how to get past the way, get, get through a lot of stuff because you can get slick enough that you know how to answer almost any and everything. Not so with this final crisis. There's only one qualification. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When that final crisis takes place, we're all going to be squeezed. We're all going to be squeezed. And you know what happens with a sponge. If you dip a sponge in orange juice, when you squeeze it, what comes out? If you dip a sponge in grape juice, when you squeeze it, what comes out? My brothers and sisters, if you and I still have a little bit of self still remaining in our hearts, when that squeeze comes on you, what's going to come out? Self. But if Christ is in you, the hope of glory, then when that final test comes and it squeezes you, what's going to come out? Christ. And this is when you'll love your enemies. You will pray for those who persecute you. This is why the humility of Christ, we must learn it. Now watch this. Bring it to a close. Four points of humility that must be our study and must be our aim. This will prepare us, brothers and sisters, to receive that latter rain. I lied to you not. If we can learn this, because what it's going to do, it's going to allow us to enter into a very real conversion experience by which our sins can be blotted out and we can receive the refreshing. Four points of humility. Number one, we must learn to humble ourselves towards God. We must let God be God. The Bible makes it very clear in Isaiah 45. 
You go from verse 6 to verse 10. The Bible makes it clear, I am God and there is none else. You got to make a decision. Who calls the shots for my life? If you are allowing yourself to maybe make 10% of the decisions while God makes the 90, he's not happy. You read Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. The Bible is very clear. You shall seek me and you shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. You cannot hold on to 5%. It's like a husband and wife. Imagine you're married and imagine your spouse cheated on you with another man, another woman. And here it is, your heart's broken, you're crying, and then eventually you go to your spouse and say, how could you do this to us? How could you do this to our home? How could you break up our home? The spouse realizes, I can't believe what I've done. I was wrong. Can you please forgive me? Because Christ is in us, the hope of glory. Amen. We say, all right, I forgive you. Let's give it one more try. That husband or that wife says, wonderful. You know what? This relationship was so strong with the other person, I don't think it would be healthy to just do like a cold cut. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the majority of my time with you. But I'm going to hold on to the other adulterous party, and I'm going to wean myself off the relationship. So I'm going to give them maybe 10% of my time. How many of you would agree to that foolish, crazy agreement? How many of you would agree with that? Not one person in this room. But do you know that that's what we do with God? Sin is an adulterer. Sin is an infiltrator. Sin is a home destroyer. That's what sin is. It kills everything in its path. And what some of us are doing, oh Jesus, I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you, Lord. But this one thing, these few things, let me just hold on to that. Lord, I'm giving you 90% of my life. But this one television program, this one video game, this one guy, that one girl, and you name it, you pick the sin, the one that so easily besets you. And many of us are trying to have that kind of relationship. We're courting God, getting ready for the wedding, and at the same time, there's some other brother or sister in behind. God says the same way you would not accept that in an earthly relationship, God says I will not accept that with a heaven to earth relationship. It must be all or nothing. Now listen, when you come back this afternoon, I got to tell you right now, it is not for the purpose of me doing this for any other reason, but some of you are going to be startled. And the reason why is because as I sat on my bed this morning and I started to go through and the Lord just said, tell him this. And I literally looked at it and I said, Father, that's strong. And God says, tell them because they want to receive the rain. Amen. If they really want the rain, they must meet the qualification. And so this afternoon, I have no games to spare with anybody. I'm going to spell some things out. And that's why I thought to myself, I said, this is very interesting. As I was watching Brother Michael and he's just going through sin, 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 and all these things and victory over sin, I said, amen, this is perfect. He's preparing the minds. Because this afternoon, we're going to spell it out crystal clear. We're going to get super, super detailed. What really is sin? What is it that must be overcome that we might receive that latter rain? And so it is that God wants us to understand. First step, you must humble yourself towards God. You cannot say 90%. I want you to start thinking right now. We're getting ready to close it. I want you to start thinking, where is the percentage of my life that I still call the shots? I'm not letting God have rulership. When I talk with my father figure, Thomas Jackson, he said, Dwayne, I've been in ministry for 40 years. And God put him to sleep. Went to London, went to bed, and did not wake up. His heart stopped. It just stopped, cardiac arrest. And he did not get oxygen to his brain for over 30 minutes. The prognosis for anybody like that is vegetable or death. I just finished doing a camp meeting with this man where he's spitting out verses from memory. God restored him. And he got the lesson. He said when he woke up from his death sleep, the doctors were amazed. They checked his arteries clean. He had arteries like an athlete. They could not find any reason why his heart stopped. None. 
God communicated to him and let him know, I stopped your heart. And he said the first word that came out of his mouth when he woke up from that death sleep, the first word that came out of his mouth was surrender. He's been testifying all over the world. I've been in ministry for 40 years. And he said, and my whole life was not surrendered to God. This is a message for the pastors in the room. This is a message for the gospel workers in the room. Sometimes we think we're surrendered because of the office we hold, of the position we're working in. But this man says, I've been in ministry for 40 years, baptizing, preaching, teaching, everything that we do. And he said, I still was controlling the wheel. God is saying to every single one of us, until you take your hands off the wheel of your life, and God says, and you let me fully control it, which means everything you do is according to my word and my word only, nothing else. He says, I'm not pleased. I'll be patient, but I'm not pleased. And so it is. Humility is, number one, humble ourselves towards God. you got to get off the throne of your heart and let God put himself fully on the throne of your heart. You don't call the shots anymore. Number two, humble ourselves in our perception of ourselves. This is so important. How many of you know what the third angel's message is? What is the third angel's message? Fear God, get, well, mm -mm, no. What's the third angel's message? Okay, let me give you a clue. What's the third angel's message in verity? Now that's, okay, righteousness or specifically justification by faith. All right, evangelism page 190. And if you just work the verse out, you can see that literally that the third angel's message is justification by faith. Now watch this. Another area we need to humble ourselves in, we need to humble ourselves in our perception of ourselves. Let me show you something that a lot of us struggle believing. Go to Romans chapter 4. Winding it down. Romans 4. When you look at Romans, the fourth chapter, all right, Romans 4. When you look at Romans, the fourth chapter, I'm going to show you something. I showed this to my brothers and sisters at the Mentone Church, and uh, we had a good time. The Bible says in Romans, we're looking at the fourth chapter. When you get there, please say amen. All right, now watch this. Look carefully at this verse. Sometimes we miss it. So the third angel's message is what? Justification by faith. That's what the third angel's message is in verity, in truth, in the highest sense. Now watch this. Therefore, you agree we all need to experience justification by faith. Would you agree with that? Okay, now watch this. Romans 4, verse 5. The Bible says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Do you want your faith to be counted for righteousness? Do you want to be justified? According to the verse, what must we super emphatically accept? Huh? Jesus? Righteousness of God, okay, we're missing it. And the same way we're missing it in the verse, many of us are missing this in our day-to-day -day life. It's right in the verse. This is an open book test. It's bad when you fail an open book test. All right, here we go. Here it is. It's right here. Let me show you. You ready? All right, I'm a bad teacher because I'm giving you the answer. But watch this. It says in verse 5, But to him that worketh not... But believeth on him, here we go, that justifieth the, what's the next word? According to the verse, who are the only people that receive justification? The ungodly. Can you accept that you are an ungodly person? You see, until you and I are convinced that we are ungodly, you can't be justified. Tell me that's not deep. Until we're convinced, I am an ungodly man. I'm an ungodly woman. Until you can be convinced. But as long as you drive your car, and man, God help you if you got a nice one, there's something that makes you sometimes say, doing all right. When you go in your house and your house looks a little nicer than everybody else's, there's that thing that 
when you press the button to enter your door, put the key, whatever you got, and when you walk in your house, it's just this. I'm all right. When you look at your bank account and you see a sufficient amount of zeros after the number, it's something that makes you sometimes say, doing all right. When somebody tries to ask you Bible questions and you can remember from memory, there's something that says, I did that. Look at what I did. Look at what I accomplished. We have all sorts of subtle little ways that we convince ourselves I'm not so bad. And God says, that's why I can't justify you. Until we can see he's altogether lovely and I am altogether ugly. It is until I can be convinced that I am so dangerous that I can't afford to even make one decision for me or for my family on what I think is right. I must submit my mind to the word. And every decision in life you make, what clothes will I wear? Let me go to the word. I don't trust myself. What food will I buy? Let me go to the word. I don't trust myself. Who should I marry? Let me go to the word. I don't trust myself. Until you become afraid of yourself. Because you know who I'm afraid of? I'm afraid of ungodly people. That's why I don't let them in my house. You understand that? If somebody came to you, hey, I'm an ungodly guy, man, let me in. You'd be like, nah, brother, I can't let you in. I got children here. I got a wife here I got to take care of. I, you know, if you're going to tell me you're ungodly and crazy and demonic, I'm not letting you in my house. But God says, that's you. And you understand why you're still on earth and not in heaven yet, Dwayne. And I say, I got it. Thank you, Lord. We must, true biblical humility will give you a right perception of yourself. I must understand, oh my. First Chronicles 29 and verse 14, you remember that? Where he says, all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. What am I boasting about? If you have the ability to crunch numbers really well as a CPA, it's because God keeps your brain cells moving. You ever read Acts uh, 17 and verse 26 or 28 where it says, In him we live, move, and have our being. You could not do the surgery that you do if you're a surgeon in the room, except it be that God allowed every part of your motor skills and everything else to still function right. If God were to remove his grace from us, you see these precious young people, how they came up here? Do you know it takes a lot of skill to be able not only to play a guitar, but to sing simultaneously? That takes a lot of skill. And rather than these precious souls saying, look what we did, God is saying, I did that. God is saying, I enabled their minds that they can do two movements and have two different focuses. Think about it. They have to focus on maintain the tune, but they have to focus on sing the words. At the same time, God says, I did that. Every single heartbeat Medical ministry, page 8, it says every beat of the heart is supervised by the great I am. Every heartbeat. Why are we boasting? Why do we say, look at my ministry, look at my this, look at my that, look at my... God's like, word not for me, you couldn't do the things that you're doing. And so true humility must help us humble ourselves in our perception of ourselves. True humility, humble ourselves in our relationship with other people. These are the four points of humility that will help prepare us for the latter rain. I'm not down to the fourth yet, but these are the three right now. What is going to help us truly prepare to enter into a true conversion experience by which God can blot out our sins and we receive that latter rain? Number one, humble ourselves towards God. Number two, we must learn to humble ourselves in our perception of ourselves. Number three, we must humble ourselves in our relationship with other people. You remember what Paul said in Philippians 2? He said, let each esteem others better than themselves. 
That's Philippians 2 and verse 3. We ought to prefer others before ourselves. This is humility. And what you're noticing so far, no room for selfishness. Finally, number four, we must humble ourselves in regard to the circumstances of life, whether good or bad. Romans 8, 28 must be our motto. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord and to those who are called according to his purpose. No matter what circumstances happens in our lives, we can say God is doing something. Somehow he allowed this to happen to me because his desire is to save me, to strengthen me, and to enable me that I might bear more fruit for his glory. Now, my brothers and sisters, I close with this little thought here. Inspiration says in Desire of Ages 535, paragraph 2, implicit belief in Christ's word is true humility, true self-surrender. My hope and my prayer is that we will really search our hearts. You want to get the latter rain? You want to be fit for the close of the judgment? It will not happen unless we internalize and embrace the humility of Jesus Christ. And he loved us enough to show us by example how to live. And my hope and my prayer is that every single one of us in this room will take to heart the words that have been shared with you today. Christ wants you to really know what it is to have his humility. You see, this is why at the end of Jesus' life, think about the things that he left for you. In living this humble life and going through all this persecution and problems, think about what he left. He says, peace, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus left us his peace. That humble life was so effective, he was able to leave peace for everybody to partake of. Not only that, you remember what he said in John 15, 11. He said, these things I command you, and I tell you to do it, he said that my joy might remain in you and your joy will be full. So he didn't just leave us his peace, he left us his joy. All of these are the beautiful virtues that he left for you and I to partake of by faith. But number one, Jesus says, receive my humility. As you receive my humility, you will demonstrate my love. You will have my joy. You will have my peace. You will have my long-suffering. But the foundation, the humility, selflessness. And I guarantee you, you make those four things your focus. Lord, where am I off? Like my brother said earlier, search your heart. Father, what point of the humility of Christ? Because did you notice that in all those points of humility? Did you notice that? Did you notice Humble ourselves towards God. Humble ourselves in our perception of ourselves. Humble ourselves in our relationship with other people. Humble ourselves in regard to the circumstances of life, whether good or bad. Do you know who fulfilled this perfectly? Jesus. I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He humbled himself towards God. He humbled himself in his perception. He says, I can do nothing of my own will. I only follow the instructions of my father. He literally just functioned like, look, I'm not here to just show everybody how great a God on earth I am is. He said, I came here to serve. Humble ourselves in our relationship with other people. Jesus served enemies. He did everything from wash their feet to allow them to literally spit in his face and pull his beard off and did not retaliate, not even once. He humbled himself in regard to the circumstances of life. When it came time to go on that cross and for the first time in his existence to have his father look at him with disdain, disgust, 
And the father had to turn his face away from him because his son is now the living representative of sin. Jesus says, not my will, thy will be done. This is who I leave you with. I leave you with the pattern man. I leave you with the only one who is worthy to behold. Every other patriarch, every other prophet, all of them are moons in comparison to that son of righteousness, Jesus. And so my question to you is very simple. If you know you need the humility of Christ, and it has not been a focus in your life, but by God's grace, it will be from this day forward, I want to invite you to stand to your feet. I want you to stand to your feet. God's going to bless you well beyond your expectations. And if there be any of us in this room, maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus. Maybe you never thought he was worthy of it. Maybe you wanted to run your own life and do things your own way. You come to church, but you never surrendered your life. Remember what surrender is, right? Remember that? It says, implicit belief in Christ's words is true humility, true self-surrender. Maybe some of us have never surrendered our hearts to Jesus. Maybe we've never made a decision. Lord, take my life and let it be consecrated unto thee. You have the whole of me now. There might be some people in this room that you've been holding back. You have not let God have full control. And if you're in this room today, you need to resolve this before you leave because this is a true story. There was a, a preacher who was preaching the word, pouring out his heart, calling the people to accept God. And there was one woman that she was resisting, resisting, resisting. She heard the voice of God's spirit saying, you need to give me your heart. You need to surrender everything. You need to let me have full control, not partial. She said, no. The service ended. She went outside and went across the street to go to her car and was struck by a vehicle. And she died. And I don't say that to scare you. I say that to tell you the Bible is true. Our lives are but a vapor. We can literally be here today and we can be gone tomorrow. And so today, if you hear God's voice, the Bible says, don't harden your heart. It's not worth it. I wonder, is there anybody in this room? We all can bow our heads and close our eyes, please. And I'm just asking, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, is there anybody in this room that says, I've never surrendered my heart to Jesus? I've been too afraid to let him have control. Maybe I was convinced that I thought surrendering my life to Jesus would be a life of punishment rather than pleasure. And for whatever the reason is, you've been holding back, but today you are willing to say, Lord, I allow you to have full control over my whole life. And this is the first time you're making that decision. If that's you, I'm going to just ask you, slip your hand up in the air while everybody else's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just slip your hand in the air. Praise God. Thank you for that. We're talking about first time, like first time. Amen. First time, you're saying, Lord, that's it. Full control. Full control. I just want to say to every precious soul who raised your hand, you literally, I want you to understand this. I mean it with all of my heart. You literally just passed from death to life. You hear me? You just passed from death to life. When you're in control, that's a life of trespasses and sin, which is a life of spiritual death. But when you say, Jesus, take control of my life, I'm afraid of myself. I'm beginning to see how godly you are and how ungodly I am. The more that you take that position, Christ says, good, now I can justify you. Now I can do it. That's why you raised your hand. And so we're going to close with a word of prayer. And for those who raise their hands... I'm going to ask you to meet me up front just for a few minutes. I want to give you some good counsel, some things that you can do as you leave this place at the end of our wonderful weekend together so that way you can stay committed to the decision you have made. Let us pray. Oh, loving Father, thank you so much for this day. It's such a joy to lift up Jesus. It is truly a privilege I can remember, Father, when I was at the clubs. I can remember lifting up my hands, glorifying the devil. It is such a privilege to lift up Jesus. And I thank you that you have given me a sincere heart towards this thing. 
It's a miracle. But you, that's exactly what you do. You do miracles. You did one today. You helped us make a decision to take that final leap, to put our full trust in you, to be willing to fall into your arms. And I know there will be reluctancy and fears and many things that the devil will try to introduce to us. And I pray for those precious souls who raise their hands that you will enable us to equip them with sound information that will lead to sound transformation. And I am thankful, Father, for all of the others who have taken their stand to say the humility of Christ will be my goal and my aim. And I praise you for this. Bless my brothers and my sisters abundantly is our prayer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.